Hello and welcome to this channel. In this video we will talk about tetanus. This is a huge topic, but I will try my best to give you a short and concise summary. So what is tetanus? Tetanus is a potentially lethal infectious disease caused by the gram-positive bacteria Clostridium tetani. One of its most distinctive features is its ability to form spores which are highly resistant to heat, drying and disinfectants. These spores can survive in soil for many years, making them a persistent source of infection. Furthermore, the bacteria can also be found in the gastrointestinal tracts of animals and with that in their excretions. Another very important feature is that it is an obligate anaerobe. This means that it can only survive and multiply in environments that are closed off of oxygen. This also explains why deep wounds and puncture wounds are especially dangerous in the context of tetanus. The bacterium enters the body through wounds, burns or the umbilical stump of newborns. Any breach of the skin is a potential entry for the bacteria. However, deep wounds with anaerobic conditions provide the most favorable environment for multiplication of the bacteria. In which areas can tetanus be found? It occurs globally and is particularly prevalent in regions with poor sanitation and low vaccination rates. Tetanus leads to around 50,000 deaths globally per year. With the introduction of vaccine programs, the number of cases was reduced drastically in areas of the world where the vaccine is readily available. What is the incubation period? The incubation period for tetanus typically ranges from 3 to 21 days but can vary from a few days to several weeks. Once developed, the disease is not transmitted to other people. Which symptoms does it cause? There is the classic triad of symptoms that are used to diagnose tetanus. These are first trismus, which is the medical ter term for lockjaw. It is the inability to open the mouth due to spasms of the muscles in the jaw. Second, rhesus sardonicus, often described as a grinning appearance caused by involuntary contraction of the facial muscles. And third, opistotinus, a severe arching of the back caused by sustained muscle contraction. While these symptoms are characteristic for tetanus, it is important to remember that most patients will not present with all three symptoms, and sometimes none of them. Other symptoms include fever, tachycardia, hypertension, and changes at the side of the skin where the injury occurred. Which toxins does Clostridium tetani release? Clostridium tetani bacteria produce two main toxins the neurotoxin tetanospasmine and the hemolytic and cardiotoxic tetanolysin. Tetanospasmine disrupts the neuromuscular system by targeting inhibitory neurons. It invades Renshaw cells, which are interneurons crucial for regulating motor neuron activity. Within these cells, the toxin destroys snare proteins which are essential for the release of neurotransmitters. The subsequent impairment of snare proteins prevents the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters, such as GABA and glycin. So to recap, tetanospasmine prevents the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters. So the neurotransmitters are actively working all the time. As a result, alpha motor neurons responsible for muscle contraction are excessively stimulating are excessively stimulated leading to the characteristic muscle spasms and rigidity observed in tetanus the toxin travels retrogradely from the periphery to the central nervous system 
In addition to tetanosbasmine, Clostridium tetani also produces titanolysin, a hemolytic and cardiotoxic toxin. Titanolysin binds to cholesterol in cell membranes, causing cell lysis and cell damage. How can we diagnose tetanus? Diagnosis of tetanus is primarily based on clinical symptoms, even though wound cultures can potentially identify the bacteria. Laboratory tests are not routinely done for confirming tetanus. They are, however, sometimes used to exclude other potential causes of the tetanus-like symptoms. These tests might include a complete blood count to check for signs of infection or inflammation, an electrolyte panel to assess electrolyte balance as imbalances can mimic some tetanus symptoms. And depending on the specific circumstances, additional tests might be considered, such as cultures of the wound or cerebrospinal fluid analysis. Which conditions could potentially mimic the symptoms associated with tetanus? Local dental infections, particularly those affecting the jaw, can cause trismus and can be mistaken for tetanus. Certain tumors can cause muscle stiffness and spasms. Encephalitis can result in altered mental status and muscle rigidity. Some seizure types can include muscle contractions. Depending on the location of a stroke, it could also cause facial weakness and muscle stiffness. What are possible complications of a tetanus infection? Complications of tetanus can be severe and include muscle spasms of the respiratory musculature that can lead to difficulty breathing, laryngospasm, so spasms of the vocal cords, and potentially respiratory failure. Tetanus can potentially cause severe tachycardia, severe hypertension, and life-threatening arrhythmias. Severe and prolonged muscle spasms can result in fractures, rhabdomyolysis, so breakdown of muscle tissue, and long-term muscle pain. Other complications include pneumonia and a pulmonary embolism, so blood clot in the pulmonary blood vessels, which can occur as a result of the weakened condition of the patient due to a prolonged hospital stay. How can we treat a patient with tetanus? The standard treatment for tetanus involves measures to neutralize the toxins, provide supportive care, and preventing complications. First, we usually thoroughly clean the wound to remove any potential bacterial spores. After that, we give the patient a passive immunization with human tetanus immunoglobulin to neutralize circulating tetanospasmine. The dose of the human tetanus immunoglobulin depends on the severity of the wound and the patient's immunization status, but also patients that have gotten the vaccine before usually receive passive immunization. We also usually give an active immunization. The tetanus toxoid vaccine should be administered to provide long-term immunity, especially if the patient's immunization history is incomplete or unknown. The patient routinely also receives IV antibiotics, such as metronidazole or penicillin, which are used to kill the Clostridium tetany bacteria. Symptomatic care, as medication like benzodiazepines, are used to manage muscle spasms and reduce the risk of complications. We also often offer respiratory support, pain management, nutritional support, and fluid balance management. What is the prognosis for a tetanus infection? The prognosis for tetanus depends on the severity of the disease, the patient's age, and the timeliness of treatment. Mortality rates can be high, especially in unvaccinated patients. While the mortality rate has decreased significantly due to widespread vaccination, tetanus remains a significant health threat in many parts of the world. In developed countries with adequate vaccination coverage, the mortality rate is relatively low. How can we prevent tetanus? Prevention of tetanus is primarily achieved through vaccination with the tetanus toxoid. 
The first administration of the vaccine is typically in the first year of a child's life and consists of three vaccines. The vaccine is often in a combination with the vaccines for diphtheria and pertussis. Booster vaccinations are recommended every 10 years, also for adults. Proper wound care is also crucial. Any wound, but especially those contaminated with dirt or soil, should be rinsed with water and adequately disinfected immediately. If you suspect that you or someone else might have tetanus, please seek medical support from your local health care providers. That's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. If you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you for watching and hopefully see you again in the next video.